Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Happy Monday. Look, if it's any consolation, the days actually start getting longer after today. Today is the is the shortest, darkest day of the year. So if you're kind of feeling it, it, it will pass. I think it's going to pass. I think things will get better, right? Molly Jong Fast, right? <laughs> and you, you feeling better? I, you, I mean, it's very dark here in New York City. You've been kind of in a mood. I'm just kind of concerned about that. It's the this like welcome to the winter of yes. 2020. <laughs> Are you up for this? Yeah, it's pretty bleak. I mean, you know, I usually go and visit my dad and my stepmom and my brothers in California for Christmas. So as much as like I'm very grateful to be happy and healthy, it is quite. It, there's this. It's sad, and also I miss like like not wearing 10 coats when I leave the house. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I am I'm. will admit to being kind of in a bad mood. However, when it gets really cold, one of the good things is that when I take the dogs out, because we have big dogs, yeah. um, the, if the ground <laughs> freezes, we, we don't have like mud everywhere. Right. It's, it's that when it's right around 40 degrees or so and kind of wet, it's kind of like, I don't want to be inside and I really don't want to be outside and I don't want to come, you know, it's just the transition and nobody wants to hear this. So, so, okay, I, w- I want to talk about, we have so many things to talk about and I want to work up to the fact that the president of the United States was sitting in the White House talking about the possibility of a military coup with Mike Kelly. I personally think that's kind of a big deal. I could just, I just want to, you know, yeah. mark that. Uh, let's work up to this for, for a moment because I know Molly, I know you want to talk about Martin Shkreli, don't you? That story. You know, it's funny. Sometimes there's a story that's so, I mean, I was reading it and it was like, I forgot I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, how much time has elapsed since I started reading this? Okay. So for people who, who, the one or two people who haven't read this story, Martin Shkreli, of course, is one of the most loathsome human beings on earth. He's the farmer, bro. He's the guy that uh, became famous for jacking up the price of one of his drugs by 500,000%, no, 5,000% or something like that. Yeah. Something He just became just a thoroughly awful, deplorable human being. And he's now serving seven years in jail. This is the story about this well-known respected professional journalist who was covering him and then decided yeah. to write a book about him and then, then became romantically involved in him and is now sitting around waiting for him to call her from prison it's like what the hell um yeah that story is so i mean and then the the uh, the thing that was incredible was the journalism professor saying like I don't wonder. Yeah, don't do this. This is going to end. I mean, it's it's found. I think the reason that a lot of journalists are interested in it is because we can all on some level relate to it. I mean, maybe we haven't blown up our entire lives for but a But you can source. get too close to a source. Yeah. You, yeah, you can you can cross it. I, I remember once uh, an editor said, uh, you know, what, 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 was, what was the line about if, if if you cover the circus make sure you're not fucking the monkeys or something yeah like that. I, I just it was some weird thing i'm a, i will admit though that i have a, a fascination with this on a completely different level um the the martin shkreli level that he's the most loathsome just obnoxious human being on earth but i keep asking myself so what if the republicans had nominated him for president yeah you know that the same thing would have happened i, I just i'm just trying to think through in my in my in my slightly Trump deranged mind here uh, trying to think that if you're willing to go along with Donald Trump, then you'd be willing to go along with Martin Shkreli. All oh. he would have to do would say, OK, I'm going to cut regulations. I'm going to jack up your drug prices yeah. and I'm going to uh, cut taxes. And they would have been all in for Martin Shkreli. Oh, yeah. No question. And there's a lot of similarities between Martin Shkreli and Donald Trump. Yeah. No, um, I, you know, if, you know, if he would have said, hey, um, whatever. Um, the, the other thing that strikes me about this is that once you've been conned, you just can't break out of the con right. that this is the power of really horrible people to draw people in. And that yeah. once people have sort of crossed that, that Rubicon, we don't want to come back to that in a minute. Um, cross that Rubicon. That. You just, you just, you kind of wallow in the delusion. You become an, invested in the delusion. And here's this woman waiting for him to call. And he's caught, clearly dumped her from in prison. Yeah. It's it, the story is just wild. I mean, I feel that it's hard, you know, Part of me feels, I feel a lot of compassion for this woman because she's had her entire life ruined. But there's also a sense in which, you know, it's she. It, it's so interesting because it does really echo the Trump situation in a strange way. Like this person has had 
you know, the Republican Party, you have all of these people who have like done every, you know, they've given their money. I mean, they, these people, right, all of these people have given these donations to Trump in the, you know, with this fantasy that he's going to help them. And he's taken the money. And, you know, it, they're, I mean, the story that didn't get any play this week is the Jared Kushner shell company story, which strikes <laughs> me as a pretty big story. Right. I mean, that's the problem. There's just so much going on here. So, again, we're going to I'm, I'm I'm working up to the, the the whole military coup thing and my newsletter today where I said impeach him again, question mark. And, and by the way, that's kind of a almost a, 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 a maybe. So what is interesting, though, just to keep in mind, is that this this taste for sedition and the push for martial law is is kind of gathering a little bit of momentum in yeah. in the in the magaverse. I mean, yeah. this is the Arizona Republican Party chairwoman. Her name is Kelly Ward. And <laughs> yes, I'm sure you saw this. She we know her well. Wow. Yeah, you know, this is Chemtrail Kelly or Kelly. yeah, Chemtrail Kelly. Yeah. She ran for Senate. She will run for Senate again. She may be a United States senator someday. She says, "Mr. President, we are with you in Arizona. We are uh, working every avenue to stop this coup." And to stop our republic from crumbling, misspelled, patriots are united. Those who are against us are exposing themselves. <laughs> then it says, cross the Rubicon. <laughs> now, the big question is whether Kelly Ward actually understands the historical reference of what it means to cross the Rubicon, right? I mean, yeah, is, no way. Yeah, Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon. It was, in Roman law, it was treason for a general to cross that river into Italy. Um, he crossed the Rubicon, which started a civil war, and it ended up with him being dictator. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Does, does she know the end of this movie? Okay, now, he, I think she'd be happy with the end of this movie. I don't think she meant Rubicon, though. I mean, I don't. These, they're, you know, she is not one of the great minds. I mean, though, no. she probably is what the future of the Republican Party at this point. I, I want to try this out on you, though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't, yes. I don't think she meant Rubicon. Now, what do you think she meant? The Rubicon. (laughs) (laughs) Because this is the story, right? The Rubicon continues. Right. They win the (laughs) Rubicon. Give us more money because we're going to file these lawsuits that that are just one judge away from winning. And and this is this is working for it's working for the Trump campaign. It's working for Lynn Wood. It's working for Sidney Powell and everything. Uh, it, it is. Speaking of, of Lynn Wood, th- this is the guy that's out there, yes. who's you know p- p- pushing for Marshall and and for new elections, right? Yeah, for people who think we're exaggerating about this, this is Lynn Wood basically saying that whatever Donald Trump does, there's going to be you know violence in the streets. Let's play Lynn Wood. We're in a color revolution in this country. We had a disputed election. The playbook is now for violence in the streets. They planned it. It's going to happen. People tell Trump, President Trump, if you do this, there's going to be street violence. There's going to be street violence either way. That's part of a color, color revolution. They divided us. They tried to make us angry with each other. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. And, and have you ever heard of a guy named Brendan Dilley? No, who's that? This is a guy you, you, should, you should really check this guy out. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is a. I played him before because he's one right. of my favorites. He's a MAGA life coach. Oh no! This is the thing, MAGA life coach. Oh, no. And he, he's not taking this well. He's he's not taking he, <laughs> he's not taking this well. And and he's and he's got some thoughts about his his plans for a Biden presidency. Jim, oh, no. play Brendan Dilley. Something I don't know if President Trump knows. If you actually leave. We're not going to stop and it won't be organized and it probably isn't going to be as clean as had you Mm -hmm. done it. I say this because it's true. I'm not fucking doing or living under an illegitimate presidency. I'm not living under something that was absolutely rigged by China and Iran. Fuck that. I'm not doing that. Fuck that shit. Why would I continue to pay my taxes? Why would I continue to follow your illegal laws? No representation, no taxation without representation. So I'm not being represented. If you allow it to be st- stolen, I will make my life's mission to take back America, whatever, however that fucking So this means. is going well. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that guy does not pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's um... always the people who threaten to stop paying them. Mm. I'm, I'm guessing he doesn't pay his mom rent. <laughs> that, 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 that he is renting from his mom, but he actually never bothers to actually pay her rent. 
these sorts uh, of things. Yeah. Okay. I so mean, I'm... I feel like Trump. We we recently saw that Trump only pays only at least in 2018 only paid 750 dollars in federal income tax. So mm-hmm. like taxes are not, I think, the best threat. Trumpers. So, so I'm, I'm playing this to give people a sense of there's there's some crazy out there. And so, of course, I know all the, the, the smart, cool people are going, rolling their eyes, saying, oh, Charlie, of course, you can find some nut anywhere. I mean, this is not that. I mean, you know, sure, it's, it's you know, crazy people on Twitter.com. Well, a- except for the story that we read over the weekend that the president of the United States is sitting in the Oval Office and he's considering ideas like naming the Kraken lawyer. Sidney Powell is a special counsel. They're talking about uh, seizing voting machines. They actually talked about this. Rudy Giuliani actually called the Department of Homeland Security and asked about seizing voting machines. He was turned down by Ken Cuccinelli. Okay, so Molly, <laughs> when Ken least, Cuccinelli yeah. is a bulwark of democracy. <laughs> and then if you read into the New York yeah, Times, not article, great. you get to paragraph six. Um, that it turns out that Michael Flynn recently pardoned felon. Michael Flynn was also at the meeting. And uh, as the New York Times tell us, during an appearance on the conservative Newsmax channel this week, Mr. Flynn pushed for Mr. Trump to impose martial law and deploy the military to rerun the election. At one point in the meeting on Friday, Mr. Trump asked about that idea. (laughs) And I wrote, wait, back up here. The president asked about what the president is asking about. Hey, would a military coup work? I don't know. Why was that not the screaming headline? Trump discusses possibility of military coup. But that's just me. Yeah, because you're. Yeah. I mean, no, it's crazy. And I think we're very desensitized to it at this point, which is really scary. And it keeps getting me back to this question of like, it does how do we stop ourselves on this path well for next time yeah well how about for this time we have 30 yeah. days to go yeah and, and look you know i i i, I, I want to i'm generally in the optimist category but it does you're sitting i was sitting around this weekend going all right what exactly are the guardrails what stops them from doing this the in, institutional resistance you know that that that, that might happen um, but normally there are just two definitive checks on a president, right? You right. have, you know, defeat at the polls, which he's not recognizing, a 25th right. Amendment, which is a complete joke, right. impeachment and, reno- you know, and removal, which is we sort tried. of not going to happen. Not- yeah. But at some point, I mean, you know, you have to have a hammer to break the emergency glass, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know what I mean, in, in some ways, the only thing I've seen that makes me think he won't be able to just be like, I'm president for life is Mitch McConnell. Yeah, well, that makes me feel better. Because he did, I mean, he did come up and say, you know, Biden is the president and don't try to mess around on January 6th, which, of course, Tommy Tuberville took as a dare. Oh, yeah. Tommy Tuberville is, um, you know, they're, they're sort of a you kind of you know elbowing each other aside, you know, who's going to be the most mega like senator. And, you know, yeah. if Tommy Tuberville does, then Josh Hawley's going to jump in and then Ted right. Cruz, to me too, you know, and <laughs> little Marco and all of those guys and Marsha Blackburn. Yeah, and, Marsha uh, Blackburn. Well, okay, so here you have the report about the President of the United States in the Oval Office talking about, I don't know if it was in the Oval Office, but you know, talking about the possibility of a military coup. Max Boot writes, yeah. does, does point out, never before in U.S. history, has there been a record of a president discussing a military coup to stay in office? <laughs> this is like worth noting. And of course, Republicans were very outspoken about it, which of course they weren't. This is Congressman, this is Congressman John Curtis. Um, is he from Utah? Anyway, Congressman John, let, let's let's play the soundbite of his oh, forceful yeah. response to the president actually talking about the possibility <laughs> of bringing in the military. Of Utah, Congressman, um, you were one of the first Republicans in Congress to acknowledge President-elect Biden's victory. I want to get your reaction to, to the stunning reporting out of an Oval Office meeting last night, including talk of martial law and screaming matches. Well, let me just tell you, I've been in Congress for three years, and for three years I keep hearing all of these worst-case scenarios. We have to remember it was a conversation, not a revolution. Uh, there are far more important things in front of us, and I think we need to move on and tackle them. <laughs> but that's all you have to say to that? I mean, I understand there are far more important issues, and we had you on to talk about COVID, and we will Look, in a second. But 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 we, we, we can't just grow numb to incidents that, that would happen in a third-world country, and we would have a State Department that would be alarmed about hearing these types of reports. 
Listen, you're talking about a conversation that reportedly took place. We don't know anything about the details, and, and you just can't get me all riled up about that. Does it bother you? It bothers me that it's such a big deal to so many people who know nothing about the right. facts and know nothing about the details. Uh, well, he's definitely not riled up. Yeah, he's not riled up. Yeah, so um, for the people saying, well, you know, the, the in congressional guardrails would hold, it's like, well, he didn't actually start a coup. He was just talking about a coup. Yeah, I, it, I mean, it, it is, it, it's amazing. The Republican Congress has been just so pathetic in their enabling of Trump. It's, I mean, they signed that letter for that insane Texas lawsuit. More Republican congressmen signed it than didn't. Yeah, that, 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 I don't know whether he, he signed it, but you know what this is basically? This is the whole, it was just locker room talk. Right. You know, oh, he didn't really mean that. You know, Access Hollywood video, it was just locker room talk. Oh, coup right. talk, locker room talk. Although right. I did think it was interesting, you know, they report, you know, Jonathan Swan's report over the weekend that, Senior Trump officials are uh, increasingly alarmed that President Trump might unleash and abuse the power of government in an effort to overturn the clear result of an election. Officials tell me Trump is spending too much time with people they consider crackpots or conspiracy <laughs> theorists and flirting with blatant abuses of power. Here's my favorite quote. Um, the people who are concerned and nervous are not the weak need bureaucrats that we <laughs> loathe, a rattled aid told uh, Swan. Jesus. These are the people who have endured arguably more insanity and mayhem than any administration officials in history. Well, if only they had been warned, mm -hmm. you know, if only there had been some indication. So these are the people who are completely OK with all the bullshit conspiracy yeah. theories and all the lunatic stuff. But it's like when he's talking about, you know, actual coups. Well, boy, that's this is this is. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, no, it, it, that is the thing is how how these people have decided that this is too insane when, you know, we have. We had Scott Atlas in the White House saying, well, just let's let these people get it because, you know, some of them will die, but then it'll be better for the economy. I mean, I just think how you when you draw that line is pretty insane. And there was an op ed today in The Times about like, you know, I don't know if you read that the woman from the office of the legal counsel talking Brian about Newland? it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how they had done more damage than good. And it's certainly true. I mean, I think the good news is, again, like I always think about, like, how do we not get fall into autocracy the next time? And what Masha Gasson said to me was that it's this idea of narrative. So the more narrative that comes out of this White House about what happened, the less likely we are to fall for this again. I don't know if that's true, but that's certainly one of the few defenses we have. And so reading this, a lot of these people are trying to launder themselves and, and trying to, you know, find a second life after Trumpism. But I also, and, and that's deplorable, sure. But this is so important, I think, too. No, I agree with you. And, um, you know, my, my, I've become so cynical that I wonder whether some of these people who are, you know, expressing alarm about this will turn around and support Trump for, you know, Trump 2024 right. because they want four more years of that, which is like, really? You've seen the worst case scenario. Look, I, I understand there's some people out there saying what we don't need is you never Trumpers to be all smug about this. Well, OK, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep the smug down. But we told you that this is something we have been saying this for five years. Yeah. Don't do this. You put this, you know, the serial liar, con man, fraud, narcissist, authoritarian in the presidency and it will end badly. And it's like, yeah. well, yeah, don't don't you give us that. I told you so stuff. Well, we did freak can tell you yeah I mean, that that's that is the case so i have to say though mitt romney uh is is, is sort of stepping up at the moment yeah and let's let's throw some breadcrumbs here uh mitt romney stood up over the weekend and he was very forced we have a little bit of mitt romney audio here new elections in states that biden won they also have discussed appointing conspiracy theorist Sidney powell as a special counsel to investigate her baseless claims of election fraud, and also issuing an executive order to seize voting machines. This is, needless to say, quite alarming and scary to a lot of people. What's your response? What will Senate Republicans do to make sure none of this madness happens? Well, it's not going to happen. Uh, that's going nowhere. And I understand the president is casting about trying to find some way to have a different result than the one that was delivered by the American people. But it's really sad in a lot of respects and embarrassing because the president could right now be writing the last chapter of this administration 
with a victory lap with regards to the, the vaccine. After all, he pushed aggressively to get the vaccine developed and distributed. That's happening on a quick time frame. Uh, he could be going out uh, championing this extraordinary success. And instead, uh, he's leaving Washington uh, with a, a whole series of conspiracy theories and things that are so nutty and loopy uh, that people are shaking their head wondering what in the world has gotten into this man. And I, I think that's unfortunate because he has more accomplishments uh, than this uh, this last chapter suggests um, uh, we, he's going to be known for. So Molly Youngfast, this is an, actually an interesting point, is that the president is, is that is the president Trump could be making this vaccine into something that would be, you know, make people feel a little bit better about him. I mean, it's yeah. one thing that he can at least claim some association with. The fact that he's doing nothing, that he's completely shut down doing his job as president, let's put that aside, but that he's also completely put down, you know, stopped marketing himself or any possible successes. I mean, this guy's in a really dark place. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> no question. And and I think, though, remember, at every point when he's had the chance to do the right thing or even the politically expedient thing, he hasn't. So I think it, it's it, I mean, if he were a normal person, sure, he would try to launder his career. But he's not a normal person. He's sort of, you know, he's he's such a narcissist and he's sort of deranged in his actions. The thing I'm curious about, and I, I'm curious to know if you, if you think this is possible, theoretically, is could Mitt Romney and the other sort of sane Republican senators have their own caucus? Because if they did, wouldn't they be, you know, you if you got sort of three of those people together, wouldn't they be sort of the most powerful senators? Yes, they would. Now, whether it's a formal caucus or not. And and this is the case of any time you any time you you have a divided uh, a divided senator a divided house that uh, that every senator's power increases and yeah if, if you want to have a three or four member sanity caucus uh, yeah you you could you could make a difference even even if Mitch McConnell says uh, I'm going to shut down the Biden administration and uh, vote against all of his nominations and I'm not saying he's going to do that but if he did you could have Mitt Romney and a few other guys going yeah you know what um, we're not going along with that. Yeah. And and, and, with, and without us, you don't have a majority. I I would, I have to say, I would love to see that. Like, I feel like that's the kind of partisanship that we need. No, I agree. Okay. Now, before we pass on from move on, is that, is that what, I want to talk to you about a couple of your recent pieces, but before we move on from the, the, the crazy here and, um, and, and, and I understand that, that people, you know, when I, when I play something like uh, Brendan Dilley, the MAGA coach, or, or Lynn Wood, people are saying, well, okay, these are fringe characters. The scary part, though, is the fact that the president is listening to fringe characters. The yeah. Powell in the office, he has, you know, he has General Kelly, you know, in, in the Oval Office with him. And in case you missed it over the weekend, Peter Navarro, who is his trade representative, who's been a longtime <laughs> nut. I mean, yes. and, and, and for, for some reason, we sometimes gloss over this. He came up with a the Navarro report on the election, which every rational, sentient person who knows anything about elections looked at and said, this is just complete crap. It's just yeah. utter nonsense with fur on it. Um, but but he's on you know, still talking about the need for, you know, for the deep investigation. And what's interesting about this soundbite is that he this is a guy, again, who's you know, works for the president of the United States, rather important position, yeah. is now suggesting that maybe Georgia postpones its runoff election, which I'm sure Republicans find very helpful. <laughs> this, this, is, this is Peter Navarro uh, flying his freak flag here. Do you believe this was organized in big cities by somebody in Washington? Uh, so there's, there's a couple of things to unpack here. First of all, one of the findings of the Navarro report is that there's no silver bullet. There's no single thing that did it. It's death by a thousand cuts or death by these six dimensions of election irregularities. Uh, yes, it was coordinated in the Democratic Party with respect to things like relaxing rules uh, in Georgia with that consent decree or going into Pennsylvania and having them change guidance or going into Wisconsin and having them change the definition of indefinitely confined voters. Brass knuckle stuff. And, and this all should have been fought out um, in the legal process because they're clearly breaking the law. So, yes, it was coordinated 
coordinate. This is like a page right out of Lee Atwater's book. It's like, get it done, stuff the ballot box by any means necessary. And, and we need that wow. investigated because we can't go forward and have, for example, I, I, I strongly believe that that election in Georgia needs to be postponed to February till we sort that out. Georgia, of the six states I looked at, is a cesspool, a cesspool of these election irregularities. And, and if the people in Georgia and this country can't have confidence in that election and we wind yeah. up with this, 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 these irregularities putting in two Democrat senators, um, the, the, the election yeah. has consequences. We all, we all know what's going to oh, happen after wow. that. Wow. Yeah, it says, yes, it was a plan. It was a plot everywhere. <laughs> they came up with things like, hey, in the middle of a coronavirus, change the absentee. Like, this is a part of this vast malign conspiracy. I, you know, this is part of the problem is Donald Trump is listening. He's talking to guys like this. I think that, you know, he has he is spending too much time with people like this. And and I, I look, I, I don't want to be I guess I am being alarmist today. So, so screw that. Yeah. If if if. If this if this is a president who is terrified of losing power and desperate to hold on to power, what is he capable of over the next 30 days? Yeah. And nobody knows the answer to that. So. Yeah. I'm, I mean, that is wacky stuff. And you hear Maria, Bar of course, it's a Maria Bartiroma, Lou Dobbs in a dress interview. We, I, as soon as I heard the voice, I knew. But yeah, I mean, it's just insane. And it's really scary. And, and I think you're right. Well, could we talk about something more important, though? Yes. Something that really matters. I mean, yes. really, there, 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 there are some things that really, really matter to the average American today. On, yes. Uh, December 21st, 2020. Let's talk about Hunter Biden. Yes. <laughs> yes. Why are you not talking more about Hunter Biden, Molly? Right. And his laptops. Yes. And his laptops. And his well, art but, career. But, Okay, but I mean, isn't isn't there a certain whataboutism? Okay, so uh, you know we we've been concerned about uh, the Trump children. We know you talked about the the the, the, the failed the failed children, what they've been involved. Isn't Hunter Biden pretty much the same thing? I mean, if we're if we're concerned about Donald Trump's uh, you know grafty kids, why not uh, Joe Biden's grafty kid? You know, I'm oh, I actually believe that it's fine to investigate all of the children and all of the presidents, like investigate them all like do. Why not? Like, there's no reason that any of these people should be they're close to power, like good. But realistically, Hunter Biden is a struggling artist in California. And Ivanka Trump has a White House job. Her husband last week was, you know, there was this big story about him opening these shell companies so that it, theoretically, and again, we don't know, but half of, you know, there's been all this missing campaign money. It may have gone to the Trump family is, is the, you know, and hi, there's some historical precedent for the Trump family taking missing money, right? Like Eric's charity. And, you know, this is, this is not the first time that this has happened. So we'll see what happens. But, you know, we, the difference between a a child who works in the White House, and this is, and again, Ivanka and Jared are the first time ever that uh, presidential children have worked in the White House. So that is, again, a big, big difference. I mean, not even Nixon, right? Um, well, yeah. I, I agree with you. I'm, I am willing to have the absolute same standard about tax evasion applied yeah. to Hunter Biden that we applied to Donald Trump and vice versa. Yeah. What, what, whatever the standard is, whatever we know about if, if Hunter Biden's got some some, you know, some questionable, sketchy tax stuff that that that's good as long as we enforce it on uh, Donald Trump to the same level. Um, yeah. And, and I, I have to say, you know, one of the things I keep thinking about is what is going through Donald Trump's mind, because there and Romney does raise a good question that that there is an alternative approach that Trump could be taking right now. But this strikes me as a man who is absolutely terrified of stepping out of that White House. And I yeah. understand that he doesn't want to be a loser. I've read all of those stories about how that's like the worst thing in the world for him. But there's something else here. Yeah. And, and I think it's kind of and part of it is, is Donald Trump's habit of projection that he assumes that everybody else is going to do what he does. And he knows he's about to turn over the power of the Department of Justice and the IRS and all of this to his political foes. And there's something about that that I just think triggers him royally. Yeah, I mean, and and, and rightfully so. I mean, this guy's going to be, I mean, think of all the criming that's gone on in this White House. I mean, I don't think we even begin to see what's, I mean, look at Scott Pruitt. And I mean, think about the greatest hits of the people who've been, I can't imagine the kind of stuff we're going to find out, you know, three years from now, four years from now, 
when we start unpacking this. So I think he has every right to be worried. Yeah, no, I agree with you. In fact, I think he's asking, he's thinking exactly that way, which is like, they're going to find this out. So they yeah. get this too. They get that. They, they're going to see all of this stuff. Uh, I won't have any U.S. attorneys. I won't be able to call up uh, Jeff Sessions or Bill Barr. Um, by the way, speaking of Bill Barr, it is interesting in these final twilight days, Bill Barr being fired. Which yeah, is something that we did not have on our bingo card right at the beginning yeah. of the year. Did not see that because he was just not quite corrupt enough for this president. Yeah, but also in the last two days, throwing Mike Pompeo under the bus. Mike Pompeo was was willing to step out and said, "Yes, we are under cyber attack. It is the Russians. The evidence is overwhelming. It is the Russians." And then you have Donald Trump throwing him under the bus, saying, "Yeah, I don't know if it was the Russians. Maybe it was the Chinese, <laughs> and maybe it was also the elections." And you know, and under normal circumstances, that would be just this, oh, my God, the president of the United States has just, you know, once again, slapped his own secretary of state, run cover for the Russians. This is ridiculous. He's not defending the country. And yet that's like number eight of like the weird things that are going on right now. Yeah, I, I was surprised because Mike Pompeo seems like such a sort of partisan hack, but I guess he was still not hacky enough for Trump. So do you have any strong feelings about the, the COVID relief bill? It just strikes me that we spent $900 billion and everybody on Twitter.com hates it. But at least, <laughs> at least we got the return of the three martini <laughs> tax credit deduction. Yeah. And like somebody said, this is my bottom line. I think we have this because this is what will save America's restaurants, I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, there's so much wacky stuff in that bill, and, and as it is with so many things. Um, I think it's good that there was some legislation that happened. And again, there are these like endless lines for food banks and these terrible statistics about hungry children coming into the holidays. So that is not uh, good optics, even from Mitch McConnell. But it is to me kind of, you know, it's, 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 we are the only wealthy country where we're not giving people money to stay home and that and so they're not staying home and so we're a really sick country with a lot of people dying and and that is a choice that american exceptionalism has made right and that the government has made and um but ultimately it doesn't have to be this way so well, okay, so I, I, I'm 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 torn on this because I I used to be a fiscal conservative until I realized that there were no fiscal conservatives anymore. And uh, you know, I mean, you know, w watching Republicans stand up on the floor and saying, you know, we can't give people twelve hundred dollars because that will bankrupt our children after having like run up what seven trillion dollars in national debt. Right. But it does strike me that that this ought to be targeted. There are people in a K, right. in a in a K shaped recovery. There are people who are doing fine. If you if you have not missed a paycheck, if you right. still are employed, yeah. you don't need a check from the government no. right now, especially because we do have the people lined up at the yes. food bank. So there are yes. people whose lives have been destroyed, whose jobs have been destroyed, businesses that have been forced to close. You, you know, is it that hard to prioritize the people who are hungry, in need and out of work? Versus just basically doing the Charlie Kirk thing and having the cannon that she blasts cash out. You know, I'm, I'm talking about this video yeah. that's out there from yes. USA <laughs> where they have these girls in spandex who have yes. this cannon and they're just shooting cash out over the audience, which apparently is the future of conservatism. That's they socialism, but they like like cannons of cash. But that's kind of what Congress has done. They have the cannon of cash as opposed to, wait, there are some people who still, you know, Look, I mean, would I like to get a, a check in, in the mail? Sure, I would. But it would be obscene to send me a check right now. Right. No, I agree. I haven't lost my job. Um, nobody has forced my my employer to close down. Why can't we target? Not to mention the fact that we're about to have state and local governments that are about to lay off. Yes. Um, you know, essential workers yes. because of what's going on here. And so we spend a trillion dollars. We don't necessarily hit the target. Yeah, no, I I agree. I really think it's important that we have um, that the money goes to state and local workers, that it goes to things. It, it goes to people who, you know, it goes to SNAP. It goes to things that help people survive. It shouldn't go to tax cuts for wealthy people or even tax cuts for upper middle class people. It should go to tax cuts for not tax cuts. It should go for like actual support for the people 
who are on the edge of losing everything. And and it can be targeted to do that. But, you know, it was so interesting to see Ron Johnson, who is, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I know you live in Wisconsin. <laughs> And I know, but he has really gone out on a limb here. You know, you would think that the demise of Trumpism would not be the moment in which he would go full MAGA. Well, what's interesting about it, what is full MAGA? Because Josh Hawley, who's full MAGA, is right. basically going, biggest check possible, send it out there, screw fiscal conservatism. And then you got Ron Johnson, who's a different version of full MAGA. It's all mm-hmm. you know, on the conspiracy theories going, no, let's, let's all go back to being deficit hawks. And they both are MAGA in their own way, which tells me that MAGA is really not about anything <laughs> in terms of yeah. consistent policy. If Josh Hawley blow the money out as much as possible to everybody and ron johnson no just give tax cuts to people like me are both maga then maybe maga means something different than people think it means. <laughs> yeah i mean that it, that's a good point and it, it is sort of i mean i mean you when you have a political movement with no values and no tenants it can mean whatever i mean it just means like be you know racist and say crazy stuff oh, or suck up to the orange god king Right. What what whatever whatever he has to say. So what else is obsessing you these days? Oh, by the way, congratulations on the podcast. You and oh. Wilson have been how long have you been doing this now over at the Daily Beast? We have been doing it since April. But we uh you do every day, which is much more of a we only do twice a week. I have to say, like I think there's a real difference between doing it every day and twice a week. <laughs> Let me tell you. Like you are intrepid. Well, no, I, it, it, in some ways for me it's easier. Because it's something you do every single day. And, you know, sort of like, it's like the difference between baseball and football. You know, you can, you can, you can lose a couple of baseball games and go, hey, I'm going to catch tomorrow, right? Right. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, it's hard. You have a radio, you have a history of radio and radio voice. And I have one vocal cord. So, uh, you know, I barely can edit together. But it's really fun. And it's super interesting to get to, um, you know, just hear what people have to say. This is the thing that that I tell people about the podcast that you know really what a what a treat it is what a blessing to be able to you know come into my office basically and every single day that I have a chance to have an interesting conversation with really smart interesting people. Yeah. I mean that that doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, I love it. I have to say like I just love hearing what people have to say and I love getting to learn new stuff and I just find it really interesting. Um but you know it it is definitely you i think it's it's weird when you do so much writing because it's just sort of like the opposite genre right. i was i was just going to say that it's easier than writing i mean yeah. i don't know how you feel uh, about writing i love having written but yeah. writing writing and i've been doing this for a very long time yeah it's still hard it's oh, yeah. to me that's work sitting here and talking to molly jong fast about stuff that's just cool that's <laughs> like you know that's like okay you know you leave work, you go to the bar, you sit there and you have an interesting chat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's true. I do like get very kind of obsessive about like if people don't like something and what they didn't like. And, you know, I, like I do these, we read, we sometimes read ads and I'm, I read these ads and I'm terrible. <laughs> and everyone finds it hilarious how bad I am at these ads. You know, I did a car, a garage door opener ad the other day. Yeah. I've never had a garage in my life. And so I, it was like, I, can, I can believe this, but yeah. and people are like, it's just totally unbelievable. But you know that it, it's very fun. I, I'm glad to get to do it. We, we have to get to like a snowblower advertiser. Because <laughs> I want to hear Molly John. <laughs> when I use my snowblower. I... It's true. <laughs> like it was some like gadget where you open the garage. And I was like, I guess the garage doors need to be open. Like it hadn't even, it had so never even crossed my consciousness. No, those things are important, though, to those of us that live in suburbia. So we're, right. we, 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 can, we can relate to it. No, but I think this is another one of the ways that the media has been, has been changing. There are just so many ways now to, to be able to express, you know, what, what's happening and, and, to, and to react. Maybe, maybe too much. Yeah. You were on, I mean, is there any part of you, um, and this is like a question I'm asking myself, this is not aimed at you, that is thinking that, that if, if you were really, you know, wanting to improve your life in the new year, that a great new year's resolution would be to spend way less time on Twitter? You know, I, 
I mean, my husband always said there's this, that it's like somewhat, there was some great analogy where there, and, and I've never done this and he's certainly never done this, but it's the idea of that sometimes there are these people who smoke cigarettes dipped in formaldehyde and the first drag is amazing. And then you feel, you I feel like you're going to die, right? And you get sicker and sicker from smoking it, but you can't stop because, you know. Um, and that used to be my feeling about Twitter. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I feel like the the problem with our dependence on technology is that we all sort of truly, in the back of our minds, believe it's evil. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure it's evil. No, it's not, the technology is not evil. People right. are. People are evil. Well, <laughs> but you, know? you see, when and, and, I and have bad faith. Right. Well, no question. But what I love about Twitter is that I people write to me who I would never meet and tell me stuff that I would never know. Yes. Right. And I love that. Yeah. No, my wife is actually much better about it. She actually has relationships with people and, and connections on a human level that, you know, I, I don't know that it would be possible without 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 the social media. On the other hand, being, you know, being an only child as I am, this is not one of my needs that I need to fulfill. So um, <laughs> I'm an only but, child, too. Oh, are you really? Well, that doesn't that explain a lot, though? <laughs> well, my father has two children from his second marriage who I who I think of as my brothers, but they're mm-hmm. much younger and grew up in a different household. But yeah, no, mm-hmm. I think it. I think being an only child is absolutely you are forever that. No, I, 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 th- I think that's 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 true. And, you know, my. What I struggle with, though, is that places like Twitter do distort your view of humanity. And, yeah. and I've said this before, you know, that the, in the in the in the <laughs> before times when I would leave the house and actually go meet people. <laughs> you remember that when in the, yes. in the, in the before times? Vaguely. I like, like speak. <clears throat> it, it always actually did surprise me that people were were much nicer and more reasonable and more thoughtful than, than yeah. I was expecting because I'd spent so much time on 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 twitter so i kind of have to remind myself of that that you sort of get the best and the worst of humanity and you know what i need to put out another one of my psa's every once in a while i do a thing saying hey just a you know note that that if i blocked you please don't take it personally it's just because your your tweets have become too stupid to read it's like, look, I, you know, and then people are like, well, so-and-so has blocked me because and Charlie has blocked me because I said this. No, it's, it's, it's basically because your stuff is too stupid to read or your arguments are, are so bad faith and, right. and, 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 you're, and you're just an obnoxious troll and I don't need you in my life. <laughs> and so I've liberated myself <laughs> from, from, from your bad faith bullshit. And so, but please don't take it personally. It's, just, it, it, it's about me, not about you. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Because right? I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. I just want I want to never hear from them again. <laughs> it's very sensitive. Which I think is is like okay. That's 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 not bad. So, <laughs> all right. So, you got yes. any special plans for uh, the holiday week? Um, I so my daughter and I are watching the Great British Bake Show, mm-hmm. and. We, it's really, I, you know, I neither bake nor particularly like reality television, <clears throat> but it, we're really having fun and, you know, it's very sweet. And she and I are very, bond, you know, my daughter, I have three kids, but my, I only have one daughter and she's kind of my little best friend, which is whatever I am. Maybe you're not supposed to say that, but we have a lot of fun. So we're watching that and it's, and it's really delightful. So we'll probably do that. And, um, uh, my husband and I are watching The Sopranos, which we've never seen. Oh, really? See, I have saved that. I have never watched The Sopranos. This is notorious here in Wisconsin. Right. Because I was saving it for some dark Armageddon. This is May the I, thing. I, I save shows. So it, The Sopranos. It's unbelievable. Like it, it holds up well. Oh, my God. I mean, it's inc- it's incredible. It's, it is like... Absolutely. I, I can't believe we haven't watched it really? before now. Yeah, it's Good. it's no, it's like huh. it's re- you really and, you know, these are not I mean, gangsters are not my you know, I mean, everyone's a little bit interested in gangsters, but it's not something that I, you know, have huge, uh, a huge amount of information about or I'm particularly obsessed with. But this show, the writing is incredible. And, the you know, you have the mundane therapy stuff which is totally accurate and fascinating and this and the incredible 
world of New York in the 90s, which I live, you know, in 80s, which I lived through. And it's just inc- incredible and, you know, all encompassing and absorbing. And then I'm reading Philip bit. Ross, Blake Bailey, by uh, Bla- ba- ba- Blake Bailey's Philip Ross biography. Huh. I have not read that. So is, is, is The Sopranos as good as The Wire? I never watched The Wire. Oh, you are so blessed. I mean, you have that to look forward to. <laughs> I'm doing that now. You, you have two of these amazing ones. And th- there are a couple of others that I've been saving, but The Sopranos is one I've been saving for many, many, many years. Molly Jong Fast, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to talk to me and looking forward to uh, who, what, what's your next podcast that you and Rick are doing? We're doing today with Tim Miller. Tim Miller. You're, you're Tim Miller. Well, Kate, my whole newsletter is is sort of a playoff Tim Miller because Tim was basically saying we should impeach Trump again. And I'm yeah. like, OK, this is not a crazy idea. Um, it's not going to happen. But, you know, may, maybe have it in the queue. That, that's where I came down, which is that that, you know, you're not going to spend time on it. But maybe somebody should take the time to draft the articles just to yeah. kind of put in your back pocket. So that if things get really, really bad and you need to have a hammer to break the glass in case of emergency, that it's there. But uh, yeah, Tim's a, Tim's a great guy. He is so talented. I mean, he and JVL mm-hmm. and this Jim Swift fellow, uh, you guys have really, really, really good people. Well, and we are coming up on the two year anniversary of the bulwark, which we have to figure out what to do about. So Molly Jong fan, and you were with us really from the beginning. So we really appreciate that. <laughs> So yeah. anyway, thank you and um, Merry Christmas. Have a great holidays. Um, we will probably see you in the new year. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again. <laughs>